uh, program I had with us today. So um, I'll just hand to you without further ado. Thank you. Thanks, Hugh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, hi to all our friends in all the schools of architecture and to our own students and staff. And also today, we happen to be having an open day in WIT, so there's a chance that we have some future architects listening in. And uh, regardless of what school you go to, you're, you're, you know, uh, you're going to find out a lot about what we all do in common. It's a common purpose. So you're very welcome to today's episode. A big hello also to Ian, one of our graduates, uh, and thank you for participating. And we also have uh, one of our own staff, um, Gordon, uh, live with us. Looking forward to that, Gordon. And then a special treat at the end, uh, finishing up with um, uh, Alex, who runs Year 5, and he's giving us an insight into the wonderful work he's doing with his team and students there. But I'm now going to hand over to our producer, director, editor, broadcaster, uh, Gary Miley. Gary, bring us through it all. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay, hi Maura. Yeah, as Maura said, we have a few things to look at today. Uh, we have an interview with another of our former students, Ian Watchorn, who has uh, been living in New York for about 11 years. He's just set up his own practice and he's going to talk about that. We have a really uh, very beautiful film by Alexander Kostic. It's a film he's made about a project that he's been running with our fifth years over the past few years. and. Uh, yeah, that's something I think you're probably not going to want to miss. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing. If you have questions um, on any of the, uh, all of the people who are participating today are here on Zoom. So if you've got questions, just put them up on chat. I'll read through them as the other pr presenters are going through things and we'll try to get your questions, your comments uh, as we can. But we are going to start uh, with something, something else I suppose you don't want to miss. Uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Gordon Chisholm, he's always on the search for new ways in which technology can be integrated into the learning delivery process. And this, of course, is now a topic which has become very pertinent in the past year. Now, we're very lucky in WIT that we have someone like Gordon working with us because it means that we can sort of keep ourselves close to the cutting edge. So in the next few minutes, Gordon's going to give you some ideas about how you can bring another dimension to online teaching. So I'm going to leave you now with Gordon. Hi, thanks, Gary. Um, now he's going to hope the technology works, eh? Uh, I share my screen. And switch the camera. There we go. First part worked okay. I think the zoom has crashed. Oh, Lord. Can you hear me, Gary? Uh, hi, Gordon. Yeah, we can hear you again. Yeah. All right. Yeah, no, I think that screen sharing thing uh, crashed Zoom for me. Oh, Lord. So I had to restart Zoom. Uh, okay. Uh, so are, are you okay, Gordon, with hanging on there for about five minutes while we go yeah, through yeah. the next piece? Yeah, that's fine, yeah. When I say five, I mean 20. Good man. Thanks a million. Okay, we move on. Uh, Ian Watchorn was one of the first students to graduate with a BR from WIT. For the past 11 years, he's been living abroad, mostly in New York, and mostly working with Rem Kulhas's OMA. Recently, he set up his own practice, and earlier this week, um, he managed to get together over Zoom and have a little chat about this exciting new phase in his life. Hi, my name is Ian Watchorn, and I'm a graduate of WIT from the year 2011. To give you a brief background to my education and career path to date, I was actually a member of the first group of school leavers to uh, enter the architectural degree at WIT. After graduation, I moved to Amsterdam, uh, where I worked for a year, followed by Norway for a year, uh, before moving to New York, where I uh, live and work uh, to, the, to this day. Initially, when I moved to New York, I took a position at the well-known office of uh, OMA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture. Most recently worked at a group called Cooper Robertson, who themselves are a well-known office that partner with uh, a lot of international design architects to execute uh, museum and cultural projects in the city uh, of New York. Um, so that kind of completed my, uh, what I would say, learning curve uh, within the profession from uh, design through to execution and led me to form my own office uh, earlier this year called WOW. Uh, WOW stands for Watch Orn Architecture and Urbanism. So here we are, a uh, small office. Um, 
we've got two workstations in, in, in this office at the moment. And yeah, this is probably the center of the office, uh, the phone coding machine, the model making station. Uh, since you've been in New York, I mean, you've worked with some pretty established and reputable uh, uh, practices. What would you say is the principal lesson you've learned from working with these places? Yeah, I guess when I arrived to New York, I, the first job I was lucky enough to, uh, to get was with OMA, um, Office for Metropolitan Architecture, based out of Rotterdam, Rem Kulhas being sort of um, the, the original founder of that office. And something that I, I learned there that I carry with me through to today is the kind of, um, the sort of horizontal organization of the office that uh, the sort of ideas are sort of propagated from the bottom of the office as opposed to the sort of traditional way I, I feel architecture was, was um, practiced, which was sort of this kind of top-down approach. Somebody at the top of the practice, AKA the principal or the partner would sort of establish the idea and then it was up to the rest of the firm to sort of carry that out. I sort of describe OMA as a, an inverted version of that. So if you said that, you know, the traditional way of creating architecture was this sort of pyramid. You sort of turn that upside down. All of the ideas are sort of collected at the top, and then you know, Rem or the partners they serve as like um, you know they filter the ideas. So only the best ideas sort of make their way through to the to the sort of realized project. In many respects, this is why sort of OMA has this sort of longevity that it does. Is this constant sort of refresh of ideas from the sort of younger generation of people that come into the office. Since your time in New York, would you say that your idea of what constitutes architecture has changed from when you were in college? No, I, I, think, I think quite the opposite. I think that, you know, the real world throws, uh, you know, a lot of sort of legislation and regulation and, and, and loopholes that sort of test one's ability to actually persevere with, you know, the, 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 the what we understood architecture to be when we were in university, which was sort of architecture in its most purest sense that wasn't sort of diluted by, you know, all these other um, things that sort of affect, um, you know, architecture in the built world. So I would say that actually the challenge is to sort of, you know, um, to uh, hold on to the sort of purest sort of conception of what architecture was in university. Uh, that's the bigger challenge than, than, than for me to say that it's, that it's changed in any way. Would you say that um, your time in WIT prepared you well for life in New York? Yes. You, you can be yeah. as honest as you like about that. No, a hundred percent. I mean, I think European students stand out um, in New York. I think um, I think that there's this a really strong emphasis on the sort of foundations of architecture um, that sort of is apparent, um, you know, in a, in a European graduate. I would say when I when I started at OMA, you know, I had recently graduated uh, from WIT, and I think you know we've alluded to this before, but WIT is, 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 was at that time not the sort of named university. You know, um, the partners at OMA they didn't know where WIT was and so that that just sort of meant it was sort of uh, it was a wash and so I was judged you know purely on my portfolio rather than somehow you know oh you know Ian went to such and such a school therefore we need to take this application you know more seriously or less seriously um, and something that I picked up in WIT was this emphasis on model making and so I had a really sort of strong ability in model making that came across in my portfolio and you know, uh, soon afterwards, I was I was you know um, offered a position at OMA, which I took, and and then I was rubbing shoulders with you know graduates from Harvard University, from Yale University, from Cornell, um, and uh, yeah, I think that that sort of speaks to somehow how well prepared we were for the work environment um, as a result of our education in, in Ireland in, in, in WIT. If there was any advice that you were giving a school in Ireland about how to prepare a graduate for working in New York, what's the area that we, is there an area we, um, we fall down in a bit or maybe an area that we've got a blind spot? There is an emphasis in Ireland on the student or the postgraduate to put together their own portfolio. Um, whereas I see in 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 um, you know 
universities over here that it maybe becomes part of the fifth year curriculum to sort of prepare a portfolio because ultimately it's it, it's everything hinged because on that and i've always said that you know the job that you take first or you know that you spend your formative years in is the one that's going to define you uh throughout the rest of your career more than any other i i read i think on your website ian that you say that you don't have a particular interest or you're not particularly motivated by an architectural ideology but that you are very interested in the notion of exploring new typologies new types of spaces or right. new types of buildings um could you elaborate on that and tell us what your thinking is there yeah i think you know whenever we whenever we approach a project uh if it was uh sort of a housing project or if it was a library um if it was an office space if it was a museum we're always trying to think you know what is the what is the future of housing or what's the sort of next generation museum uh how has the sort of culture of um you know exhibition changed or how will it change in the future um you know oma obviously have worked on a number of libraries and they sort of challenged the sort of conception of like is the library now limited to uh, a sort of you know a, a a a collection of books or is it is it a social space is it a community center so it's it's um yeah the idea of challenging a typology is 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 to say uh, to constantly ask you know what's coming down the road ahead and and how can we sort of capture that in 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 architecture is there um a particular typology that you're just really itching to challenge right now yeah, I think that the bread and butter of um, of architecture is has been in the past, and even more so now is residential. We've got you know all over the world vast amounts of people moving into urban centres, and I mean it's the procurement process of, of of housing, social housing, as well that sort of really needs to be sort of challenged because most sort of cities and, and nations are unable to keep up with this sort of flow of people into urban centres and ability to sort of you know, house them. Is there any one project from your 10 odd years or 11 odd years in New York that you would say, you know, that stands out that you think, oh, this is where I learned the most or this is what meant the most or this is where I got the most? Yeah, the, the, the projects that I sort of undertook at OMA, some of which have now, you know, at long last, six years later, sort of being completed, um, were sort of those that, that sort of shaped me the most in a design sensibility. Yeah, most recently, I think maybe the, the new museum expansion, which which has been, there are some early images have been released of that and it's scheduled to start construction this uh, coming year. Um, probably, yeah, influenced me the most. Why that building? It's, it's more like why that process? What was it about that process that, and I'm, it's, it's, it's because, you know, following that from start to finish, I was able to sort of learn you know, very sort of cohesively all aspects of the, of the sort of design and construction process. Um, and that probably speaks as well to, uh, you know, you asked earlier about uh, ourselves not having a particular design language. You were more focused on the process of creating architecture. And uh, we, we believe that if, if, if that's carried through to a sort of rigorous um, standard that you know the architecture will speak for itself and when you say process would i be right in presuming that you're alluding to maybe something that is collaborative the ability to be able to work in a group to be able yeah. to, that 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 kind of thing as opposed to working with computers or, or right. tight scheduling yeah no it's much more the sort of yeah that sort of human condition that you mentioned you're about to uh, no. You already have set up your own practice. What's the what's the motivation there? You know, I think the biggest motivation. I think there's no one should ever try to do anything different if they didn't think they should. They could do it better. So um, you know, OMA was was great, but you know, there were aspects of ways of working at OMA that were unsustainable, um, and there are aspects of working in sort of more executive offices that that are unmotivating you know people want to have their sort of hand in the sort of uh design aspects as well as the sort of executive aspects of uh of of, of designing and building architecture and so the view is to somehow bring that together 
a lot of offices and the more commercially minded offices, they sort of drop model making as a, as a tool uh, in the sort of professional workplace mm. in a way that was like very um, central to the design process in school. Um, and that's something that we, that is central to, to our design process. You know, we feel that a drawing is only another tool to ultimately inform the model. And the model is ultimately uh, something that moves right through the scales through to, as you mentioned, some of the students in Ireland making ultimately a one is to one mock-up and beyond the one is to one mock-up is ultimately the building. So it's just a sort of continuation of, of scales right from when it was a maquette, a little one is to 500 or one is to 1000, you know, building and you're just constantly informing the project with more information and that's continually captured in, in models uh, of different scales. We make sure that there's a model made from day one and, and that's then the tool that we use to insert the different sort of proposals that we have and, and then together we sort of critique those um, proposals. So really it's not that. I also try to emphasize within our office that, uh, you know, ultimately you're trying to create that same sort of, um, sort of organizational structure that exists within a university. It's just that, uh, it's just that you're all working on perhaps the same project. Um, but um yeah so i really just wanted to make models the rest of my life so architecture just gave me a a, a mechanism to do that you know <laughs> it's very i'm very simply simply motivated you know what's been the biggest challenge so far in working in, in having your own business well i think it's probably that thing that everyone says you know you you have a design presentation coming up next week but you also have to you know have your accounts in order you make sure that your insurance is in order um so it's wearing many hats at once um i always say that i really love architecture but uh what i love most is sort of organizing a group of people to, to sort of get the best out of each individual you know starting my own practice has given me you know so much sort of satisfaction i've got a sort of spring in my step would you say there are any particular challenges to setting up a a, a company in new york as opposed to any other place like Dublin, for example? Well, I don't know. They say if you if you can make it if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Uh, it it is you know there are a huge there, there's a very there's a huge shortage of opportunities for young architects in America. America is a country that sort of celebrates you know bigger is better, um, and it's difficult to to get. Um, a commission for a particular project if you haven't done five of them before. Uh, there's also not a culture of competitions in America. Um, I know in Europe, you know, there's there's a lot of different sort of entryways for young architects to uh, to get a start in the field. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a little bit more restricted in America. Can you tell us anything about some of the projects you're working on right now? Yes, um, we are working on two projects uh, in Tribeca. Uh, Tribeca is a sort of um, landmark part of New York with these sort of old iron uh, facades. They typically also have a row of columns down the middle of the, 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 the spaces. And we're doing a gallery um, on White Street and a uh, creative office space also then on, on White Street. It's actually a couple of doors down. We're going to take a look. Uh, we're going to walk over to actually this project site uh, shortly. It's in on 50 White Street in Tribeca, and the blue foam insert is the proposal that 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 we've made and uh, where we've we've just wrapped up construction documents. So it's going to go into construction now shortly. Well, demolition is taking place in the gallery. Um, you know, it was a space that was sort of chopped up. You know, there's a, there's a reception on entry and then there's a sort of sequence of, of gallery spaces. So it's largely sort of a white box. Okay guys, uh, welcome to the project site that we talked about back at the office. Essentially our scheme is, is going to be this large insertion in this portion uh, of the space with the reception. And followed by the kitchen and back of house spaces to remain. And we're then going to see a large office space um, in this location. And then from here we'll have some bleacher seating and a stair that will lead to an upper mezzanine level. In front of me, there's a large exhibition wall. Ultimately, it's a creative office from, from gallery space.
What would you say that, uh, in what way has New York affected you? Working in New York in, in such a sort of multicultural area with, uh, you know, large scale projects, it, uh, it gives you a certain confidence. And beyond that, I think New York is a somehow creative capital of America. And some of the most successful architects uh, of the world are, are all practicing here. So, um, you know, there's just a, a sort of richness of opportunity here that, um, you know, perhaps I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been, wouldn't, wouldn't have been available to me in Ireland. When I was, when I was back in Ireland, between visa uh, sort of processes um, and I was working at OMA, I worked at Grafton Architects and to have them sort of, um, yeah, be this sort of worldwide uh, phenomenon at the moment uh, is amazing. Yeah, it's opening doors for everybody, I can imagine. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a real credit to them, I think, and their achievement that, of course, there's the work that you can appreciate and, you know, the career that they've had and everything. But I mean, like, in that they're opening doors for, for young Irish architects. It's just probably yeah. their biggest contribution, I would say. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think that is the, 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 the next natural follow-on is that when someone sees a, an Irish architect applica application coming through the door, they you know, that sort of profile has been raised by, by virtue of, um, yeah, you know, Grafton amongst others. Uh, Ian, I have a final question for you. If you were uh, in WIT right now, going into fifth year, and you were thinking about moving to New York, what kind of advice would you give a student in that position? Yeah, you know, just uh, the advice I would do is don't, the, the advice I would give, and, and, and it might not even be limited to New York, but, uh, you know, don't don't put yourself in a certain bracket. Um, just pitch yourself to, you know, the best offices or the offices that you most want to, um, that you most empathize with their work. Um, don't think that you came from WIT, you came from Ireland as a small place in the context of a big, big world. Um, you know, you have equal merit as everybody and, 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 uh, and as we've touched on in this, in this conversation, you know, you're equally prepared uh, to sort of work in these sort of the best offices in the world. I would just say to, 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 to reach really high. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, New York is, New York is, a, is a great place. Um, you know, it's sort of uniquely different from Ireland. So I would highly recommend it to anyone. Okay, thanks very much, Ian. Uh, I just should point out that Ian is with us online on Zoom here. So if you have any questions about uh, or comments about his work or his practice or his experience, uh, just put them up on the chat box there and we will definitely get back. Now, I'm just hoping that Gordon is with us again. Um, Gordon, I think we're going to try and redo the unbelievably ironically entitled piece called Gordon's World of Technology, wherein yeah. Gordon is going to show us how to share a screen yeah. <laughs> without it ever crashing. We'll give it a second go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that's it. No, as I said before, never, not, never worked with animals, children, and been 360. Or guys from Scotland. Yeah. Can you hear me okay there? Yes, we can. Right. I'll try this again. Ian, that was great, by the way. I really enjoyed that. The, um, Thanks, Gordon. Um, really interesting. I was just, as you were starting to talk, I didn't know you set up practice there, so it was great just to see you uh, going around the streets and uh, off to your site. Yeah. Well done. And dealing with tax. Yes, necessary evil. Right. Okay, I think we're on our way, Gordon. You think we're on our way? And um, we're on our way. We're Wait. on our way. Okay. The, um, right, I, I never gave this this title, but anyway, it's quite a good title, right? And hopefully it is a little bit wonderful. Okay. And... Um, I just fire into it there. Start the stopwatch. Don't want to run over time. Okay, so the hardware. Uh, I've got an image up there. That's my desk. Okay. Uh, working away, I have a newish monitor. I have two very old monitors. One that I had to fix many years ago. Okay. Um, an HD camera and a good mic. So hopefully they're working okay for you. Graphics tablet is a new addition, which has been absolutely brilliant. 
it's uh, made a massive difference to, to how I'm teaching. Uh, we got the light ring, so um, we'll get a nice uh, bright image of myself uh, when I go on the screen. And then we need the tea, we always need the tea, okay? That's uh, a setup there from when we were doing a recording for Autodesk University. Uh, that's on just now, actually. So you can get that recording about world skills. So the software for Clabber in the cloud that we're using, we're working on the, uh, the college works on Moodle as a basis. And then we have two platforms there, Zoom and Teams. And through Zoom, I would work with open broadcast software. Uh, it, because I'd be working with maybe a lot of different elements, whether it's in the cloud and BIM 360, or sketching, or going to Moodle to show stuff, or bringing up a PowerPoint, having multiple screens really makes that um, easier. But then instead of having to share a screen and stop sharing the screen, etc., uh, open broadcast software just makes things smoother. Uh, we on the Architecture and BIM Technology Program, we work in BIM 360 as our common data environment. Everything's up in the cloud. The students all have a place to work there and their digital portfolio is up there. And then when we're doing sketching, and so that graphics tablet comes with me down into the studios, uh, I work with it here. Uh, it can be utilized then for overlay sketching, markups, and using it as a, as a whiteboard, okay? So just a wee bit there on OBS. So that's us there. Uh, that's a kind of screenshot of the OBS um, uh, control center. And on the bottom left, you basically create scenes. And this basically, you, you link into Zoom uh, with your virtual camera. So that's what's coming through here now. I, 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 this is all coming through OBS. And I can set up different scenes. So. Uh, for instance, um, if I come along and I can go up to my start screen, so when I'm getting ready, you know, everybody's getting in the room, I've got that there, and it's the, the website just cycling through, uh, a wee message there, if you don't want to be recorded, you know, please leave, and a message for me to remember to record, okay, and then when it's time for tea, I got a little uh, uh, series of slides there from uh, the far side, you know, which... Uh, Certainly shows my age. I've got front camera. Hello. All right. I can come down. I've got display one and there's been 360 there. Display one in the front camera. Display one in the graphics tablet. Uh, and so on. You know, I've got displays, various displays in there. And I've got two PowerPoints in here I'm working with at the minute. So that's just back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So it just makes nice and easy and smooth transitions. And just what I discovered today. Uh, I can draw in PowerPoint. I didn't realize PowerPoint allowed you that until I was putting this together. Okay, and then I need to just click back in that window. So, uh, Moodle, um, we we'll all get different kind of platforms from the colleges, but certainly some things I was looking to do that certainly made things quite e easier for me was at the start of the semester, <laughs> to schedule all, all my classes in Moodle for Zoom classes, the, so the students just go into Moodle and they click on the right page uh, in the classes there and it pops up. And then also all the classes are recorded so the students can get to them uh, when they want. Because look, where we are now, you know, certain people can't travel. Uh, so even when we're in studio, we still need to record and uh, show what we're doing. So that gives a good access for the students there. The other really important one is MS Teams as a space to meet and collaborate. So that's some of the teams that I've got on, on my list there on the left. Um, and one of the things, we, we just finished our Tri-Varsity uh, BIM workshop, and I'm gonna go through that in a few minutes just to show some of this in context. And when we did Tri-Varsity this year, because it was detached and we had the, the three institutes, um, we set up teams, the students had their own channels, they had the, the videos on, and they just left the videos on all day and they could chat. And when we finished, they were telling me that I really enjoyed that. It helped with the isolation and they asked, could I set up teams for them just for their class groups so that they can work away and collaborate. Um, so we've done that. I've done that on the Construction Collaboration Technologies Project last year uh, module. And the students said, you can see there, that, that slide shot there. That's them just going in there, having meetings, discussing their projects, place for them to meet and um, then we'll have to hang out, 
talk about the projects and uh, you know see each other. That's just a couple of slides there from collaborating in construction collaboration technologies, which is a module that I run in the in the January semester with um, construction managers, architects and technologies, quantity surveyors, and construction manager, managers from Wentworth in the USA. Uh, and actually we were running that and halfway through that when COVID kicked in, they just continued as normal. They had no effect on what they were doing um, because they'd all been opening up documents in Teams and collaborating. So one of the, the big platforms that we would work with is um, Autodesk BIM 360. Uh, just as a very basic level, um, it's a cloud storage. Uh, it's our common data environment. And we have set up there for the students. So they have a place, a work in progress area, and they have various other folders. But they also, I suppose on that work in progress area, by working up there, we should eliminate my memory sticks broken, my computers crashed, my laptops died, that all the work is current and up to date in the cloud and we access it. Uh, and it can be viewed, I can go in, I can view the work. Um, but also in the process of this, we create the digital portfolio. So there's no more trying to find bits of drawings and pulling it together. We have a digital portfolio there. They, they collate it themselves because that's where their submissions are for each project. And it means the externs, so if the externs can't travel, um, they can get a link and they can view the work from within BIM 360. And also uh, when they can travel, they can get a link, they can view the work before arriving at the college. So that's just some of the, the sheets that are there from the, the students, okay? So just on, on the graphics tablet, um, works really well um, as a whiteboard, as a basic whiteboard, uh, it's absolutely brilliant because I can sketch away, you can zoom in, you can do your details, you can do your calculations, um, but all these get saved. So all the, all the images from the whiteboard are saved and I upload them up to Moodle. So they get their class notes. So from after each class, any sketches, drawings done that way would be shared. Uh, and then again, working within BIM 360, um, there's markup tools within BIM 360. So we can mark up there and you can mark up uh, by typing. You can mark up uh, with a graphics tablet. And again, it's giving feedback to the students that they need. Okay, so that's the end of that. And what I will do, I hope over now to me, Trivarsity. So just to sort of show this in situ, I suppose. Um, we run this project every year along with Sheffield Hallam and uh, last year and this year Kia from Copenhagen have joined us. Uh, it's been going, I think this is our seventh uh, uh, iteration of the Trivarsity and clearly this year it's online. Now the technologies we've been using, which is, uh, you know, the ones I've just been showing you, allow you, they're designed there to work collaboratively, but, you know, part of the Trivarsity is the exchange, the culture exchange, going and visiting, um, different uh, cities and working away and meeting students in their, in their uh, universities. But we were really impressed with how well this project went this year. Uh, things like MS Teams really made a difference. So just a little bit on the timeline on the projects. Um, really 2013 is when it all kind of started off when we met up at a conference in Sheffield Hallam University. And uh, since then, it's kind of gone from strength to strength and numbers. So this year, between Waterford, Sheffield Hallam and Kia now in Copenhagen, uh, we used to work with VIA, but they had to drop out. We had 130 students uh, working uh, within 12 groups on the project. Okay, and the project was just there with the ROAs, which is um, a skills factory for Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, just across from the, the train station. Um, if anybody does know Sheffield, it's a beautiful city. Um, it's certainly not grim up north, up in Sheffield. It's, um, it's a great place. Um, so one of the things that we do uh, in order, when you're doing any sort of group project, and uh, particularly these are big groups of 10, 11 students, is to get them talking and knowing each other. So getting the getting the project working. And uh, so what we do is what we call the prelude. 
And this time we kind of had an official start to the prelude. Um, and a prelude is when we can get them set up on Microsoft Teams. They can start talking to get the brief. They can start discussing the brief. They start getting uh, a BIM execution plan put together. They start setting up the common data environment up in BIM 360. And, you know, um, getting themselves prepared, okay? Because when you're working on, on these types of projects, there's a lot of work to be done. It's very intense. And spending the first half day deciding who does what can take a lot of time away from the project. Um, we also brought LinkedIn to it this year just to see how that would work. And I'll show you. So one of the one of the things to look at on the prelude is uh, a Gantt chart. And they put down on the left the tasks and uh, time on the right. And as you can see, most of the work is actually done between Monday afternoon and Wednesday lunchtime. Um, but the whole idea of organizing it is to see what tasks need to be done, um, to think about the presentations, to have somebody there to organize the presentations uh, so they can pick up slides, images as they go along. Um, you can see there over on the right there, um, BIM 360, getting the documents set up there, and an image there, 2.2 delivery team overview, is from the BIM execution plan and who's got certain roles and what they have to do. Okay, and one of the things we did as well, just to get, you know, try and get a bit of, um, you know, group camaraderie going, we, we asked everybody to produce a 30 second um, video of where they're from. So that's just a, a selection of them. Um, Okay, and then the teams. So again, they were all working. With, the whole thing was kind of run and work through teams. Um, as I say, gone through the numbers there. So we had um, architectural technology students, structural, uh, who looked after the structural end of it as well. The key students, they are architectural technology and construction management students, and <coughs> they took looked after the MEP modeling. And WTQS4 joined us again. Uh, which is great to have them in there because they they um they look at the cost and all it and uh, they bring out discussions um that wouldn't normally happen you know uh, some of the comments in the past have been you know the the q s uh, element there you know arguing about how much p v can go in the building because of the cost and et cetera so they get a sense of that and they get to see you know the building that they've they designed and put together what the cost per square meter is going to be. One thing that worked really well, again, was the shared lectures. We had uh, lectures to all students being conducted from Sheffield, from Waterford, and from Kia. Uh, and it's something there that um, I think looking down the line makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, as you can see, there's an image of um, a lady in, in Copenhagen giving a class in Dynamo. I don't think we've got any dynamo experience in uh, in WIT, but that is something that we can, you know, tap into. And likewise, um, you know, the lectures that I gave on BIM 360 uh, was elements that um, Kia weren't necessarily um, using to, to the same degree. So I think that could really take us forward a bit. That's Kia's uh, workspace. Uh, so kind of half their class group stayed at home and kind of half came into a uh, studio space and in, in Harlem they had maybe you know a dozen students stayed in the studio space but what was really nice there they had the big projector up and they projected all the the classes and the people from uh, uh, that were taking part in the groups okay and uh, Microsoft Teams so just sort of some of the collaboration going on there now that was great for us you know, we had it set up with one one MS team. We had uh, twelve channels in it, and the channels were limited to the the students in the channels plus all the staff. So what we did for walking around, we used to we would normally walk around the groups and talk to them and and, and help them out. Now what we're doing was just doing a virtual walk around, just dropping in. They'd have a, a video on the go, and uh, we would just drop into the video and uh, have a chat there, answer questions. Maybe there was a particular issue and and uh, one of the staff would stay with them and the rest would move on. Uh, but it worked really, really well. Um, as I say, we were using kind of 
we're using BIM 360 as a common data environment, but it also uh, has really good elements in there for design collaboration and model coordination. So we were looking at uh, how you would manage the workflow of buildings, uh, building designs uh, from inception, getting them through to sharing between the design team uh, so that you could work on projects at the same time. And that was some of the comments we got back there was, you know, one of the guys who, who's just that, down the, the, the road there in Kilkenny uh, in the country was saying, it was great, the guys in Copenhagen, they updated the model and instantly I had it there to work on. I did my bit of work updated and uh, they had the stuff to work on. Um, so it worked really well. Elements in there, you see there in design collaboration, you can see the structure there. You can also see what's been added, what's been removed, what's been taken away. Um, so they could track things again now in uh, model coordination. And we had the, um, the structure there was maybe done by the, the Harlem or the, or the uh, WIT students. The services were put in there by the uh, Kia students and we we're looking at clash, clash, and clash analysis, you know. And that was one of the things that came out there talking to the groups was, you know, how do you deal with your service zone below the slab? Uh, how do you deal with the beams? Do we have drop beams? Do we not have drop beams? So all these things, you know, the highlight an issue that you may not have considered uh, and it makes it uh, clear and visible. And um, again, a lot of good learning coming out of that. And we had similar issues when we were looking at stair cores and fire. Um, a new thing we brought in this time was LinkedIn. Uh, we got them all to set up their groups on LinkedIn and just got a little bit of um, social media going, I suppose, but maybe taking it into a sort of professional realm. So they could all put up what they were doing. You can see images there, a bit of dynamo in there, clash analysis, uh, et cetera. So they really kind of got into that, uh, putting up their images, what they were doing. And I suppose then coming towards the end of it, we, we looked at this in terms of, of a marking um, everybody marked, uh, everybody that took part, everybody that joined us for the, the final presentations could mark. Um, John Merner there uh, and one of our QS colleagues uh, puts this together in Google Docs, most economical advantageous tender is what we look at. And every person can go along on their phone or on their computer tablet and mark up, you know, the questions. And, it, you know, I say it spits out, probably there's more than that. John would, uh, uh, tell me that it takes more than that. But anyway, he pulls together some graphs for us and the ultimate winner. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's a good way. It worked really well last year when we were down in Waterford because we had some food and drinks in there. And we all walked around, looked at the boards. And uh, it's a nice kind of pressure release at the end of the, the three days. A little bit different when we're online, but, you know, still went good. So some of the final presentation sheets. Okay. Um, it's looking at what's going on and um, that's some of the shots here from some of the PowerPoints. So the students would produce a couple of A1 boards and also a PowerPoint. Okay, and then this was the, the team that won it. Um, so again, just some of the visuals in there from them uh, coming together and I'll move on there. And then just a, a quick shot, we all had to do a um, little selfies as well. Um, Brian refused to let me use his one, um, and it was the best one. But anyway, uh, maybe another day, Brian. But that, that's just a, a, some of the um, software that I recall being used throughout the the, the three days. There might have been more, um, but um, yeah, worked very well. So we've got Ireland, Copenhagen, and Sheffield there in the images. That's me done. Cheers, Gordon. I think you pulled that one out of the fire. I think it's fair enough to say. Uh, Gordon, if you were able to unshare your screen, screen, it'd be pretty helpful for the next bit that we're going to do. There we go, guy. There we go. Thanks, Emil. That, yeah, was, no uh, that was very informative. Now, uh, we're running a little bit behind on time, so I'm kind of mindful that we have to move things on a little bit. So we move to our last item, and that is Alexander Kostic has been our lead fifth-year tutor for quite some time now. And during his tenure, he's developed this little project that we call a charrette, where teams from Greek myths are explored for their architectural potential. Yeah. Now, I've personally been following this project for several years, and I've been very taken with the fact that it really is a very compelling and a very engaging 
exercise. So we asked Alexander if he put a little film together to explain what it's all about, and he very kindly did that. We're going to show it to you now, and I have a feeling you're going to agree with us that you're in for a little bit of a treat. This will make your weekend. <laughs> final thesis year in WIT, um, our main goal is to uh, articulate the design position through research and uh, in a design project. We start this with an exercise we call design charrette. It is a spatial exploration of a given topic. Students investigate this concept, some sort of pre-articulated position on, on human condition and see what kind of effect this can have in space. This relationship we uh, investigated almost exclusively by physical model making. And during the last 10 years, we have um, explored many different topics and various aspects of human condition and how they, and they, they are affected in space. In 2014, for example, we explore the tension between the change and identity. How can one account for an identity in the world that is perpetually changing? And what does that mean for us uh, in architecture? At another time, we explored the relationship between the meaning and the metaphor, and so on. At some other occasion, we investigated uh, the notions of imagination and reality. What is the position of architecture concerning um, the relationship between human capacity to imagine and being in the world? To interrogate these concepts uh, of human disposition towards the world, we use ancient stories and classical texts, for example, to investigate uh, a relationship between human and landscape, we read uh, the Irish ancient story of Antoine, translated by Thomas Kinsall. But mostly we read Greek classical texts. There are at least two good reasons for that. In the ancient Greek society, the primary vehicle to preserve unity between ourselves and our community, and more importantly, the world that surrounds us, was uh, mythos or myths, story or stories. And uh, these stories responded to challenges that the world has put upon us as humankind. Through these stories, ancient people were introduced to the marvels and perils of the world and uh, human condition in such a world. Many divine and cruel creatures, secrets, plots, twists, and different turns of fortune in, in these stories were part of regular upbringing and education of every Greek citizen. These stories played a crucial role in forming a responsible citizen, and they led not only to the intellectual, but also to emotional, um, ethical, and spiritual development of, of an individual. they are indeed far removed from the present uh, conditions in our time. But the source of their attraction is not just their incredible complexity with many possible layers of interpretation. More importantly, these stories are precious to us because they point sharply at that which is intrinsically and universally human. And they do that with such an incredible, vivid and, and remarkable complexity. Students have somewhat difficult task to uncover 
that meaning in the text that comes uh, from such a distant past. To do that, one must leave behind the everyday world, the, the things that we are all used to do, the ways we are used to, to do things, and look really deeply and comprehensively into the core of that particular aspect of human condition. A while back, when we were exploring uh, the meaning of uh, democratic space or in the public realm, how do we as architects account for uh, changes in the public realm? We read Aeschylus' trilogy or, or Estaya, because the main topic in this ancient text is how the, does one society respond to the change in the way justice is dispensed in that society. Of course, the responses we were looking for in, with regards to this topic were concerning physical world and the spatial relationships that uh, steamed from that change. So we read the text, we try to understand the text, recognize the meaning behind it or the try to interpret it somehow, and then the students start their investigations by making models. These models are weekly attempts to explore this thesis in the text spatially. Typically, any technique uh, is uh, welcomed. The, the only constriction is the size. Uh, models must, must fit in prescribed uh, dimensions of 300 by 300 by 300 millimeters. And the exercise following that lasts for four weeks. These design charrettes, these models, they serve students to navigate a spatial exploration about their own research topic. It's a rehearsal of research through design, basically. This ends finally in the following semester when these positions they explore are further explored in the design project itself. This year, topic uh, is architecture between ethics and politics. What does it mean in, in the work of architecture to be ethical? What precisely does it mean? Is architecture political? Yes, but how, how so? Precisely how is architecture political? How do architects uh, mitigate, if at all, often conflicting public with private interests? To explore this topic, we read Sophocles' Antigone. This drama explores a conflict between an individual and the state. Antigone is a part, in fact, it's, a, it's an ending part of a great uh, Greek uh, saga about the ancient city of Thebes. The city of Thebes is free from the dangers of invasion. The male offspring of King Oedipus have perished. They killed each other in fighting for their father's crown. But Aetiochus was considered the defender of the city, while the other brother, Polynices, who was the attacker, was left unburied, exposed for the dogs, birds, and wild beasts to feast. The new Theban king, Creon, gave this order. But this decree is not measured. It does not only step over the noble tradition and stands outside from the general ways of life, but more importantly, it is against the will of the gods, which demands that all dead need to be buried. Antigone, who is the sister of the treacherous brother, she is in no dilemma. She is determined to bury her brother despite the decree. Her character and determination stand in sharp contrast with her sister Ismene, who decides to be obedient. Antigone is sentenced to death as a result, and Creon ignores the words of his own son, who was about to marry Antigone. After the warning of a prophet, the king changes his mind, but it is too late. Antigone is dead, and so is his son. Creon's wife also commits suicide, and in despair and all alone, the king is to witness the final fall of the city of Thebes. So, how do we deal with the conflict between the natural rights, such as 
freedom in general or freedom of expression, natural laws on one side, and the laws constructed by human. These obedience always justified under any circumstances. Uh, or does our own natural right, such as devotion or duty uh, to our family, should that come first? What happens when our determination, stemming from those natural rights, uh, come into conflict with the law of the state? How do we win the natural with human laws? In this charrette, the swirling paper describes two sisters, Antigone and Desmaini. The folds in the paper show the more aggressive and uncompromising Antigone, while the bend represents the softer Ismaini. These forms are seen as a place of intersection between mathematics and art. The form is mathematically generated through graphing of concentric circles, yet it is often used by paper sculptors for its captivating aesthetic. My approach to this model came from the characteristics of both Kriya and Antigone. Both have actions in mind, but are blind to the fact that these actions will cause chaos in the world around them. Both have the ability to see what, the, what could be a result from what they are doing, but are blinded by what they think is right. There are four elements that I wanted to include in this model. Blindness, the chaos around them, the parent structure and order and reasoning behind those actions, and also the ability to see the result of what they have done. By doing this, I wanted to show the apparent order or justification of Creon and Antigone's actions. As one looks further into the model, they will notice elements start to deviate from the order from the outside. Elements changed in height and orientation until they met at the void in the center. Each element didn't touch each other, and by doing this, I wanted to show the path that they could have taken to see the truth to what they were doing. have always been very eager to do these exercises and they explore the texts with great interest. In the last 10 years I had the pleasure of working with my colleagues Vincent Duffy, David Smith, who is now retired, and at present uh, with my colleague Harry Bent. And we were always amazed uh, with the level of engagement and, and the creative spark that this exercise produced in students' work. The topic that I want to explore from the story is the conflict between Crayon and Antigone, the government power and civil rights, the law of human and the law of nature. It is an abstract model, looks like someone just making it by her feeling, or the cuboids were combined together by accident. However, it is not uh, chaos because I actually arranged the scale of the cuboids and then put them into increasing golden sequence and decreasing golden sequence. Thus, I got two sets of numbers, applied them on the lens of the cuboids and then combined them together into a 300 by 300 by 300 millimeters cube.
we owe much uh, thanks and gratitude to the external help as well. We invited many of our colleagues, architects, but also artists, philosophers, stage designers, anthropologists, sociologists, economists, and, and others from Ireland and from uh, abroad to help us with uh, these inquiries. Sometimes in architecture, a design hypothesis is put forward as an answer to the question that hasn't even been asked or clearly articulated. If architecture is uh, or can be understood as a form of inquiry, then we should aspire to know what is this inquiry about. Design and research uh, have somewhat tensioned uh, relationship but they have something in common, imagination. Because the same as in design, the most important research effort is to find a fruitful way to put the question. So how does one begin this inquiry? How does one outline a question out there? How does one, more importantly, connect a thesis with design project? how to connect architecture with the proposition. I tell you, it made me ache and laugh in the same breath. It's pure joy to escape the worst yourself. It hurts a man to bring down his friends, but all that, I'm afraid, means less to me than my own skin. That's the way I'm made. I wanted to capture the essence of utilitarianism in my Shoresh, that is the seeking of pleasure and avoidance of pain. The base semi-pyramids represent the seeking for pleasure. They rise confidently from the base. The pyramids falling from the lid are representative of the avoidance of pain. Both pyramids represent the directional aspect of seeking and avoidance. The concept for the charrette is to represent Antigone's act of devotion towards her brother in a soft form. The final design exhibits the soft, free-flowing form to represent Antigone's devotion towards her deceased brother. The theme of stubbornness is vastly explored within Sophocles' Antigone. In order to visually describe the concept of stubbornness, a labyrinth form of complex harmony signifying the range of perspectives within a society is destructively parted by a single force, leaving behind a distinct void. This force is the act of stubbornness. In this case, the ignorance caused by one's stubbornness can ultimately lead to the demise of both themselves and the ones around them. The extreme views of justice portrayed by Antigone and Creon allows for the ability to simultaneously describe both as the protagonist or the antagonist. Both characters portray aspects of justice, yet their polarized positions lead to both creating injustice within their city and family. The model demonstrates the need to comprehend both physical and non-physical elements of justice to have a complete view of what is just. The delicacy of the suspended form illustrates the difficulty of achieving this balance. However, reflecting on the entire composition, one can see the purity and beauty of justice.
The model composed of a number of paths is reflecting the objectives of the characters in the story in Digne. As each path moves through the space, they must bend and give way to the other paths, creating a simple harmony of coexistence. The model shows the flexibility of the characters, while the sharp elements show the stubbornness of others. Even if I die in the axe, the death will be a glory. I will lie with the one I love and loved by him, an outrage sacred to the gods. I've longer to please the dead than please the living here. Never at my hands will the traitor be honoured above the patriot, but whoever proves his loyalty to the state, I'll prize that man in debt as well as life. The threat represents the personal struggles and loyalties between Antigone and Creon. Their loyalty is divided by their allegiance to one's country and one's personal devotion to family, which is pulling and twisting them apart. <clears throat> Antigone chases to please the gods and right Creon's wrongs for not allowing her brother to be buried throughout the story. My approach depicts her being immortal, sacrificing herself to please the gods above and below.